Episode 14 of the New England Sports Media Podcast coming at you right now with our guest, Brendan McGare, covers the Paw Sox, college and high school sports for the Pawtucket Times and Woonsocket Call down in Rhode Island, uh, Providence College grad, and as he told us just a few minutes ago, a uh, Rhode Islander through and through and thick and thin. Uh, Brendan, thanks for joining us. Hey, guys. Uh, thanks for having me on this morning. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's great to have you. Uh, our first, I believe, our first Rhode Island representative in our New England sports media podcast uh, pantheon here as we uh, continue to grow. It's uh, good to have you. And uh, first things first, um, high school sports are back, uh, at least in part, down in Rhode Island. Um, what has covering sports in person again been like? Well, uh, I was at a cross country meet this past Saturday morning at Ponagansett, and it was nice to see, you know, schools represented because, you know, you got to go back to March. So seven months ago was the last time I covered a high school sporting event. So it was it was great to see, you know, parents again, coaches, athletes, you know, enjoy themselves. They were all wearing masks, which was great to see. They're all following the, you know, protocols that are in place. But, you know, you can tell underneath that they were probably all smiling and happy to be back out there. What was it like for you the past seven months from March until October? What was it like? Very different. But, you know, as sports writers, you kind of base your life around games. And from those games, you kind of think of like column ideas and features to really jump off at. But, you know, with no games really to speak of, you know, especially at the local level, you were kind of scrambling to find anything of worthwhile, whether it was a, a kid who put out on Twitter that I just got an offer from Alabama track, for example, that was, uh, you know, one story I followed during the summer, or if there was any like pop-up summer leagues, especially at a baseball level, which I ended up covering a little bit, I'm sure we can get into that. And, you know, maybe a local golf tournament that was going on, but it was, it was definitely a scaled down sporting calendar which in turn made sometimes getting stories all the more challenging for sure can you uh just for the people that are listening can you kind of like describe percentage wise how much of your schedule is devoted to high school sports how much is devoted to college sports how much is devoted to the paw socks like how how does kind of the balance of your schedule in a normal year uh work out i you know obviously there was no minor league baseball but they they had the the taxi squad in Pawtucket, so um, how does your schedule work out percentage wise? You know, maybe it's maybe just to go a third, a third, a third. I, I try to give fair coverage to all of the specific areas that I follow. I also cover the Patriots a little bit, not as much as maybe mm. I would like to, because I have so many kind of quote unquote balls in the air when it comes to high school, college sports and high school. So I try to devote equal resources and equal time to each of those uh, three uh, areas that I have highlighted on my Twitter account. And when you're covering the Patriots too, like if you're not covering every, every single game or at practice, for example, like what angles, if you're going to a practice, if you're going to a game, what angles are you looking to cover? Well, one thing I try to do with the Patriots, and you know, especially for a weekly feature that for a home game, especially a game that I know I'll be attending, I try to reach out to like a high school coach from a player's past because I find that those guys especially have great stories to tell they remember those players before they went to college before they became NFL stars before they some of them even became Super Bowl champs I feel that the high school coaches had the best stories to tell in terms of where these guys came from and how they've watched them grow and mature from young men to adulthood you know some of them have kids now the the players so it's almost like fun to relive the past, but also watching them because a lot of these high school coaches, they still remain in pretty fairly good, fairly good contact with their players today. So it's great to kind of relive the past, but also bridge it to the present as well. I definitely agree with that. What are some of the, your favorite stories that you've written? If you can remember. I mean, I remember a couple of years ago when Julian Edelman, I think came back, maybe it was off his, um, his PED suspension. So we're going back to maybe 2018, I believe I was fun, like talking with his high school coaches out in California. So that was that was a lot of fun. I remember just talking to uh, Alana Roberts, a high school coach a year ago, because uh, he was named a captain before the 2019 season for the Patriots. Just talking about leadership with him and how that kind of was, you know, a, a trait that was on display when Alana Roberts played high school football. 
And even as recently talking to Cam Newton's high school coach, I thought that was a pretty good get, uh, you know, trying to track him down. And I was able, I'm so far I've been able to get two stories out of him. Just, uh, you know, it's, it's important, I think, to maybe build those relationships with those high school coaches because you can kind of turn to them in uh, different situations. And I'll give you a perfect example. I talked to James White's high school coach a couple of years ago, and I was on the phone with him just a, a couple of weeks ago after the tragedy that struck James White's family. And it was good contacts to keep up with because you never know when you might need them again. What's your process of, of finding these coaches' contacts? You just look up on the, the school website. How do you find them? It's uh, it, it, basically, you, you said it, Liam, just uh, kind of, you know, doing the Google search because a lot of these coaches, sometimes they moved on to different schools and it's like, almost like, you know, where's Waldo. <laughs> so you, you're kind of doing the search. You kind of might find the email address. You might find the athletic, e athletic director's email address. You might even call up the school. And, you know, funny story about that. I called up uh, Josh Gordon's old high school a couple of years ago and I found out that his high school coach retired, but you know, who was ever working in the reception desk, so gave me the coach's cell phone number. I thought, wow, this is pretty cool. It's a different world. Uh, you know, some people are very hesitant to give out cell phone numbers. That's why it's almost better to go the email route. But uh, lo and behold, this secretary is giving me uh, Josh Gordon's uh, high school coach's number. And we ended up chatting and, you know, things worked out great. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, so, do you do every Patriots home game? Is that kind of what your, what your Patriots coverage is? You know, pretty much, you know, I've looked at the schedule this year and, you know, we're recording this on a, on a Wednesday morning with, you know, hopefully the status of Sunday's game will still go off uh, as right. previous plan, but uh, you know, newspaper deadlines being what they are, I probably won't go to like the, the primetime games, the eight thirty games. I think they have one in early November against Baltimore. And then later in the year, a Monday night game against uh, Buffalo, which, you know, could potentially decide the AFC East this year. But uh, typically, you know, it's a lot of the day games because it's easier to get the stuff in the day, but the next day's paper. So, so did you go to the game against, against the Dolphins and the Raiders? And like, if so, how is it different than it used to be? It's a lot different. First of all, you know, you got to say from a food standpoint, the Patriots always took care of the media. They had the best spread in the world. You can go there and it was like, wow, you could be in a food coma before kickoff between everything that they rolled out. But uh, it's definitely different. You know, the first couple of years that I covered them, I sat in the second row. Now all of a sudden I'm up in the third, the first row and I have, you know, plastic to my left plastic to my right because they obviously they're trying to do social distancing protocols and you have to wear the uh the mask the whole time kind of similar when i was up at fenway park a few times this summer but um it's definitely different and it's it's almost like a library in terms of how quiet it is in the press box because uh, you have the glass up and you know people if they're talking they're talking through masks and people are saying what did you just say because i think we're still trying to master how to uh, speak with masks on for sure. So I know that, I mean, I guess, unfortunately, you know, for you, uh, you know, the Paw Sox are not going to be there uh, in future years. But I do want to ask you about covering a triple A team, covering a minor league beat, because, you know, the I, and, and I don't know it, how much of the interest in readership is people in Pawtucket who care about the team or how are doing or is it more like people care about the certain prospects and, and that type of stuff? Like, how do you approach covering a triple A beat? I think you focus on, and I've always kind of done this in, in relation to the Paw Sox, is look at the big picture up in Boston and kind of what does this mean for the current group in Pawtucket, whether you're talking about the, the journeyman who was signed as a six-year minor league free agent, and does he have a chance to get up there because he's done well at the AAA level for the Paw Sox, or you have this hotshot prospect rising through the ranks and everybody from Baseball America to – you know, MLB.com, everyone has this player on his, on his radar. You know, people want to read about someone like him. He might not be in Pawtucket very long, but, you know, we can rattle examples off about that. But, um, you know, it's always been my philosophy is to take what's going with the situation in Boston and kind of what does it mean for the group of guys in the Paw Sox clubhouse? Yeah, I think that's really smart. And this year, like, you saw some up and down too. Were you able to go to like the practice camp in Pawtucket or what was that like? I did go to the, a few practice camps. Uh, 
it was definitely different than years past because, you know, it's kind of like going to training camp for the Patriots. You're just watching guys work out and that's it. There's no real, I guess you can say competitive element where we're keeping score, we're keeping tabs. And it's not like we're going to have cuts at the end of this, where a bunch of players are going to get home, you know, for the most part, the group that was there was in or late July was the one that kind of concluded it, the core group. And then when they wrapped up the uh, taxi squad in late September, granted there was a lot of movement on the pitching front because the pit looked like the Red Sox used everybody except the three of us this year on the mound. But uh, it's, uh, it was definitely interesting from a pitching standpoint, seeing how many guys come and go. But for a lot of the young guys, I think it was a great opportunity for them to be around coaches who you know, are more seasoned than they were accustomed. Because we're talking about guys who are down at the you know, maybe low A level had just scratched the surface in terms of double A. Maybe they would have been in triple A at some point this year if we didn't have the pandemic. But uh, I think for a lot of the young guys, it was a great opportunity for them to have their eyes on them in terms of the Red Sox staff evaluating them going forward. So over the over the years covering a triple A, triple A guys, I know triple A is kind of different than double A triple A is kind of like the, the holding ground stable for, for a lot of guys going up and down double A is kind of where the concentration of prospects are. I actually worked for the sea dogs as like a clubhouse manager in high school. So I kind of have some behind the scenes experience, I guess, as well in the, in the double A triple A life. Um, what are those kind of relationships like when, when you're building with guys going up and down and, you know, I get, I'm guessing sometimes they're frustrated when they're sent down to AAA and when you need to talk to them for a story, how do you approach that? Um, and how do you kind of get through to them um, the bigger picture of, of what you're doing when they may just be pissed off that they got sent down from Boston? Well, I think there's a human element you have to take in it account too. And I remember, I think Brock Holt got set down early on in, in the 2014 season because uh, the Red Sox went out and signed a minor league uh, free agent and they automatically placed him on the 40 man roster. And Brock was up at Fenway on a, on a Sunday and he was back at uh, McCoy stadium on a Monday. So, and it was clear that he was very unhappy and it was kind of like a little bit, no holds bar from Brock. Cause you know, you wonder how, you know, he's doing, how he's approaching everything. And, you know, Brock just kind of let loose that he was definitely frustrated that, you know, a player who he thought was going to be on the disabled list for 15 days. And all of a sudden he was, he thought he was going to be up there for that duration while that player was working his way back from injury. And all of a sudden Brock's like back in the tuck because the Red Sox went outside the organization to bring in a player who they deemed could help them better. So it was, it was definitely, a, a, you know, you get those players a lot at the AAA level because let's face it, nobody wants to be in AAA. You know, it, even the, the the young prospect who's come up from Portland, they don't want to be there because they see the major leagues. They see it's like as close a, as, as it's ever been as from a professional standpoint. But you almost kind of have to tread lightly because sometimes you walk into that AAA clubhouse and, you know, there's a lot of not long faces, but, you know, you can tell that there's guys who are just, you know, they just don't want to be there because they think that they deserve a shot to be up in the major leagues. For sure. Now you're a Providence college guy. We've seen you do some Providence college features, Providence college basketball. Um, do you, what's it like covering your school as like an alum? It, it, it's, it's interesting in the sense that I basically covered PC straight out of college and you still have that little bit of a fan in you where you want to see your school do well. And it's like, you know, oh, man, like, you know, not that the, the pom-poms are right underneath your uh, your laptop or anything like that. But, uh, you know, you do want to see them do well. And, but I think as time goes on, you realize you have to root for the best story. And, you know, sometimes the best story might come at the expense of, you know, telling, uh, you know, about your alma mater. And it's almost like you have to rethink, wow, I'm not an, I'm an alum, but you know, I also have a job to do. And that kind of really takes over you at some point. And, you know, thankfully it kind of did. And it made me look at PC basketball more as strictly a journalist than being an alum slash fan, which, you know, for many years, even before I went to PC, I attended many games at the dunk 
So it was almost like kind of, of a dream come true to co- cover the Friars. What's it like covering Ed Cooley? Like, how is he with the media and how is that program? Um, obviously, some colleges at really high levels have a ton of access. Some colleges at low levels give no access. And there's a lot of a lot of in between. So what is the Providence and, and even URI, Brown? Like, what is the access like for some of the colleges in your area? You know, for Brian, I think it, it, it's great because I think they, they're always looking for coverage. Right. So you can call, help say, uh, Brian basketball coach Jared Grasso on, you can text him on a Friday and he'll get back to you pretty quick. Whereas, you know, at PC, they try to do media availability during the season once a week. And, you know, the biggest of conference calls, which are great because it's another way to get information. But it's, uh, it's interesting to see, like, you know, as you go up the, the pecking order, you can see this just in Rhode Island where you're the NEC school where, you know, any coverage is welcomed. And, you know, you can, you can text the, uh, the sports information director and you get, you get a pretty quick response. But PC does a good job, I think, in terms of laying out parameters. You know, hey, media availability is at 1.30. And, you know, maybe sometimes you got to get up there and not only get a one story, but possibly two, because it could be another week before you get access again. So is that like an open, like an open thing where all the players are there? Or is it only the coach and like a couple of players? Do you have to, do you have to request players? Like kind of like, I guess the ethos of this podcast is learning more about how people do their jobs. So like for Providence basketball, um, how do you, how does that media availability work? Well, obviously you get the coach, which is great. And, but, you know, sometimes you might want to work on a specific player feature and you'll ask, you know, the sports information director, Hey, is uh, so-and-so available? Does he want to talk? And, you know, it, sometimes the sports information director disappears because he's going back in the locker room to go find a player, see if they're willing to talk or not. And most of the time I found at least the recent years, there was a period of time where some PC players were kind of hesitant to talk maybe because you know, for whatever reason, but the group over the last couple of years, they've been far more accommodating. And I think it's helped us, you know, too, in the sense that we've done media training with the players in the summer. And basically we said, we don't bite. (laughs) We're not here to like, you know, this isn't like a Bill Belichick press conference where we're going to like throw darts at you and expect you to come up with, uh, you know, solve, uh, solve the world's problems or anything like that. It's kind of like, you know, get to know you guys because, we've told the PC players, you're almost like Rhode Island's professional team. You know, you play at a downtown arena that sits, that uh, seats almost 13,000 people. You know, people want to know about you guys. It's okay to, you know, not let your guard down, but uh, we're not going to be there to bite you pretty much. And right. uh, it's, it's good in the sense that, you know, the players are, are very accommodating and they understand that I think we have a job to do just as much as, uh, we respect what they have to do. Can you talk about the media training with the players? Like, I, I, like, what is that like? Like, do you guys like do like a like a seminar with them? Like, how does that how does that work? Yeah, for the past, uh, you know, we didn't do it this past summer because of the pandemic. But uh, you know, the previous three summers, you know, me and uh, a few other local uh, media dignitaries would go up to PC and kind of have a like a uh, an open roundtable discussion, so to speak, where we would kind of talk about what we were looking for and, uh, you know, kind of remind them that, you know, you got to mind your P's and Q's because one slip up could get you in trouble and have creating headlines for the wrong reasons. So it's kind of like, you know, and also talking about, you know, making sure your relatives aren't kind of chirping on social media because things like that could lead to, you know, negative press as well. So it's kind of like giving them a sense of what we're looking for because all the players are on social media in one form or another. It's just like telling them, be careful what you post because what you what ha- what could happen is that you end up in hot water for something that maybe you thought was cool at the time, but uh, mm-hmm. you know when we're we're thinking about. But always, I always tell them you got to think before you hit send on uh, your social media accounts because it could land you in uh, in a bit of trouble. Do you think doing that training like helps you build a relationship with the players right off anyway? Like, like I'm sure you, I'm sure you don't do that at every school or everything you do. Like, do you think kind of being there and having a conversation and this sort of relationship before actually needing an interview or a story might help you and the other, as you said, media people kind of be comfortable and the players be comfortable with you? I think so. And I think maybe the last three years, it's especially helped because it's been kind of the same group and they, they see your face in the summertime 
and they might not know your name, so to speak, but at least they know, you know, the face. And if right. they and if they don't know if the say if the SID is looking for player X and player X comes back out, all of a sudden the light bulb goes on because hey, I remember him from the summertime. So I think it's kind of helped in the sense that they're able to put a face to the person who was kind of requesting them. Yeah, you talked about the social media aspect of it. When did that kind of become a factor? Like, was that just the past couple of years? Like, when did you really see that becoming a thing that, you know, you had to tell the players and the players had to be cognizant of? Well, I remember, uh, you know, and then the, the SID at PC does a great job in the sense that, you know, they give examples to the players. And, you know, until a couple of years ago, I was never on Instagram. I was always like a strictly a Twitter person. I just started following Instagram maybe three years ago just because a lot of players were going on there. And just to kind of keep tabs, especially players who are kind of announcing where they're going to school, they kind of do the uh, the uh, the stories and and all the live videos. But uh, it's uh, maybe I've noticed it more over the last couple of years. But you know, there have also been some instances where players have posted things that have kind of been like, uh oh, and you know, not the, the sense. I don't want to be like a, a hallway monitor where you got to run immediately to the SID and say, hey. Uh, what's up with this or whatever, but cause sometimes players post messages and you're like, you know, you're trying to like decipher what does it mean? But um, it's a lot of cryptic stuff going on. A lot, a lot of cryptic stuff. And it's like, you know, I don't, you know, you don't want to, you know, get in the mind of an 18 year old kid and kind of figure out what's he doing. And, you know, you don't know what's going on through in his life right now, but you see what you see and you kind of, as a journalist, you have to kind of react accordingly. And you mentioned the recruiting aspect of it too. I've seen some of your tweets concerning some of the, the Providence recruits. How do you monitor that and know, like, know who's posting what and how do you make sure that you see that stuff? You know, you know, you know, I have a, you have a list. It's almost like, you know, when you, when a, a GM fires a coach, they have a list in their drawers of like players or coaches that they like to go pursue. It's almost like a, so as a social media connoisseur you almost have like a list of players who are like each school is kind of targeting and you know if they have social media accounts maybe you monitor them because you know you guys know some days they'll say top five coming soon top nine coming soon decision day october 9th and it's almost like you know you keep these things marked whether it's in a notepad notebook or a calendar and you're like uh Mm, this is coming soon. So it's almost, uh, you know, you got to keep tabs. It's almost like a grocery list almost where you you got to keep uh, a close vigil on what's going on. What do you think about like when you started there, like in 2005, obviously like there was the internet, but I mean, there was no Instagram and like high school kids, especially never didn't have a platform other than probably like the newspaper to, to get any information out. But now they have their own Instagrams, like they can, they'll say who they're committing to, like on their own page. But also, I feel like they're, it also makes them a lot more accessible. Like you could just DM them on Instagram rather than having to like hopefully find them at a game or something. So what have the changes been in covering high school athletes, especially higher profile athletes over the years as social media has taken a hold, especially on like Instagram and with kids kind of making their own news? The kids making their own news, but also it's also important to build relationships with the parents. You know, I'll give you a good example. We had a player uh, from Cumberland named Tyler Kolig, and you know he was a standout player at Cumberland High School for three years. He went the prep school route, reclassified to the class of 2020, and I got to know his parents pretty well because you know they would see me at every game, and I knew that he was a, going to be a you know a Division One prospect. And it's, you know, I asked the father, hey, what's his situation? What's because he wasn't as big on social media as some other players. So you kind of like, you know, want it, to it's not only important to build a good relationship with the, the player, but also with their, you know, their loved ones. No way getting around it, whether it's their parents, brothers, sisters, because they are kind of more plugged in and they can certainly help you do a better job telling a story that I think is important. I think, you know, committing stories, I always go back and forth, you know, a player who verbals, they certainly have the right to change their mind. Right. And I've seen this as well, where, you know, player X will, you know, say that they're coming there. And then they, one of the words I hate to use is decommit. And it's like, you know, it's, but, you know, they reserve the right to change their mind. And you have to realize that they're kids because, you know, they might see a coach recruiting at their position that they 
thought that they were set and are going to be part of the program going forward. But, uh, you know, I think, you know, when you talk to the parents and they're almost like, you know, it's almost like the Jerry Maguire line where they're our word is strong as Oak. And, uh, you know, when they tell you that it's done and it's real, I think uh, you have to take them at their word. When you're starting to get to know the parents of a, a top recruit or a high school kid, what's like the first conversation like that you have with these parents? Like, how do you introduce yourself? You know, you know, they, they might see me after the game and they, they, they know the face of the byline because, you know, my column picture will appear in the newspaper and, uh, it, it's kind of like very casual in the beginning. And, you know, I'm more curious from their aspect because they're the ones who are kind of helping their child deal with recruiting. And it's almost like, you know, what's your interaction with these coaches like? Because let's face it, all coaches are, they're, you know, they're being, they're salesmen. They're trying to sell the program to their son or daughter to come to their respective school. And, not only is that they're trying to sell the kid, but they also have to sell the parent and making sure that they're going to get a quality education. They're going to be looked after. We're going to do everything we can to help your son and daughter become the best person they can be. And it's always, you know, fascinating to me to see how the coaches interact with the parents. Like the, and like, say, uh, it's just like, just going back to Tyler Cole, like what's it like for, you know, the parents to feel calls from say, uh, you know, George Mason or from Bryant or from Northeastern, what's it like to deal with them? Because, you know, at the end of the day, it's the player's decision where they want to go, but no doubt that the parents have a little bit of influence about what happens based on maybe how they feel about the coach. Absolutely. Um, What other sort of, aspects do you look at when you're looking for like in a recruiting story like if you're just someone commits somewhere like who else are you talking to like who else are you involving in a story who else is important to to get a hold of other than just like the player and the parents I think the high school coach as well because uh you know just like the parents they have to uh, talk about their player as well and you know just uh you know what was that coach that college coach like interacting with the high school coach was that, you know, it's always interesting when you see these uh, stories come out about, you know, the top five and the player lists why the top five schools are in the mix. You know, how often were these college coaches contacting the player and the coach to kind of like gauge their interest and things like that? And it's always like, how often were they on them or how often they texted them? How often they did? Now it's it's Zoom calls before it used to be, you know, before the NCAA suspended uh you know, in-person recruiting, it's, uh, it was like, how often were they in contact with the player to kind of gauge where their heads were at? I'm kind of curious too. You mentioned that, that big East conference call. What's that like? Like, what are some of the coaches that are, are very talkative on that? Are there some coaches that don't say too much? What's it like? Well, it's, it, it's great. It's every other week during the season. So, you know, it always, I think all the coaches do a pretty good job, you know, giving the people what they need, because let's face it, sometimes, you know, you don't have access to these guys and this is the only way to really get in touch with them. And you'll ask, uh, you know, it, it's always interesting to, as the season goes on, people will ask, Oh, who do you think the player of the year is going to be? How many, how many bids should the league get? And, those questions always seem to generate the most response from the coaches, especially when you talk about the, um, the NCAA tournament piece, because they'll always defend their league uh, till, uh, till they're blue in the face. That's funny. Um, with UConn coming back in the big East, like, is that going to be, you know, I'm sure you'll go to the road games at UConn and like, what, what do you think that adds to covering the league? I think it's great for the league. It's uh, it's a, a, yeah, it's a true basketball school. I don't want to take any away from the football aspect of UConn, but you know, where they made their bread and butter, it's basketball. And it's, uh, it's going to be great because you have another basketball centric school. They might not be a Catholic school. Like the, uh, when the big East was revamped in 2013, that was kind of like the whole branding aspect of it. But uh you know, it's great to have another basketball school in the mix. And like you said, one that will be right down the road and, 
hopefully uh, the pandemic allows that, you know, whether you go to uh, the Excel Center in uh, Hartford or Gamble Pavilion, that'll allow me to go and see uh, those games in person. Yeah, just the last one for me is I was curious, I was going to ask you about, like, what do you think about the upcoming basketball season and indoor sports in general for high schools, colleges, professionally? Like, are you expecting, I mean, I'm sure you're preparing to go to games as they are normally scheduled, but, like, what do you, do you think that you'll be at Providence games? Do you think that the calls will be on Zoom? Do you think you'll be at high school games? Like, what is, what do you think is going to happen over the next few months in terms of indoor sports coverage? Well, I know from a Rhode Island standpoint that they are talking about a high school basketball season, which is is great to hear. You know, I I don't know. Will it, it start in January? I don't know. Maybe that because uh, right now, if everything checks out accordingly with fall sports for Rhode Island, it's going to go maybe pretty close to Thanksgiving. So maybe do you take a little bit of a, a gap? You know, you take off until after Christmas before you kind of go back to you know, a hockey or a basketball season. I don't know. It, 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 that remains to be seen. You know, I'm certainly hopeful because, you know, that means that I have things to do. And it's not like, like we said at the top of this podcast where I'm kind of scrambling, looking for material to write about. Right. But in terms of a college basketball season, I'm sure, you know, you're looking at it from a, a you know, college basketball, I'm sure they're trying to model, maybe model themselves after the NBA where you have a bubble where you have maybe three, four teams concentrated at at one time. So maybe you can knock out a bunch of games as is, because I think the biggest thing about to remember this, they want to have an NCAA tournament because not having one in 2020, it took a lot of the wind out of everyone's sales from a financial standpoint. And I don't know if they could, the NCAA can afford to have another silent March like they did this past year. Definitely. Definitely. Well, we appreciate your time, Brendan. That, that's all we've got for questions. Uh, thanks again so much uh, for, for joining us on this podcast. Guys, I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Take care and be safe.